if you're able to stand together. Good morning, everyone. What a tables, right? What tables is this? Actually, I like this way better, actually. You know, uh, so why don't, I mean, honestly, if somebody are new from neighborhood or from outside and visit a church like this, they'll be more feel comfortable, right? Yeah, that's a good idea, I guess. And thank you for inviting me again. Uh, this is my uh, third time to uh, preach in this church. And every time I come here, drive here, I change the, you know, I change of the leaves. And they makes me uh, feel like, you know, the grace of God. Uh, that change is, is good because it needs to be changed. So every time I feel, you know, uh, the grace of God, uh, I really uh, feel like, you know, God's love doesn't stay like in the same way forever. His love is everlasting because he can change whatever need we have every time. So that makes me uh, reminded of, of that. So questions. We ask questions all the time. We ask questions out of curiosity, questions of direction, questions of affirmation or objection. We ask closed questions like yes or no. We ask open questions to invite others into conversations. Questions often reflect our relationship with the person being asked. We choose what to ask, how to ask, depending on what we think about the person. We may like him, like the person, or dislike the person. We may agree or disagree, whether we uh, respect or ignore the person being asked. Our questions also expose who we are, our values and attitudes in life. In my final year, in my uh, seminary years, I presented my, the, the outline of uh, my thesis to my uh, professor. And I gave him long, lengthy explanation about my paper. And after hearing all of those, he said, he asked me one question, why is this important for you? That gave me a moment to uh, think about why I, I write this paper. I also remember another question uh, in the Presbytery of Middle Tennessee in Nashville, uh, where I present my sermon and my uh, testimony to the pastors and elders in the Presbytery meeting uh, to, uh, to be approved of my uh, ordination. And one pastor stood up and asked me one question. Do you love Jesus? That was the only question I was asked. And that just gave me a moment of consideration why I want to do this work for God. One thing I found, find myself significantly, significantly different from my young age is that I have less questions as I entered, as, as I passed my middle age and I entered my 50s. I have less questions about faith, about people, about the problems of the world, as if I, what I know already is sufficient. I guess I'm not the only one. Like the, like the phrase in the 60s, 1960s, don't trust anyone over 30s. <laughs> Adults tend, tend not to be changed. It's very hard to change people. If you see somebody changing after the age of 50, it's a miracle. <laughs> people wonder if there is any miracle in the world, in the scientific world, and there are miracles everywhere. 
Only the grace of God, the power of God can change us. Am I right? In today's passage, we find another type of question, a loaded question. Something like, why do you think your sister hates you? This is a loaded question. This kind of question is not neutral, neutral, but contains full of judgment and defiance in it. The Sadducees in today's passage begin their question by bringing up the most authoritative name for the Israelites, Moses. Our great Moses said that if a married man dies without a child, his brother has to marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. They cited Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 5 and 6, where the Mosaic law, law uh, calls it the duty of the brother-in-law to her. In the patriarchal society of Israel, it was to help the widow to be protected in the family system. Then Sadducees, the Sadducees fabricate a case for their argument. Let's say there are seven brothers, the first married and died without a child. Then the second and third married a woman. In the same way, all seven died childless. Finally, the woman also died in the resurrection. Whose wife will the woman become among the seven brothers? As verse 27 says, the Sadducees presuppose that there is no resurrection. I want you to think about it without looking at how Jesus responded to this question. Because we may hear similar questions about resurrection, about God, about the heaven, from others as well as ourselves. What is the heaven like? What is the life after resurrection would be like? Like the song, I can only imagine. We don't know what the resurrection is like. What it will be like when I see Jesus face to face. What will it be like to be surrounded by the glory of God? We have the same questions. Pastors like, like to make jokes about heaven. For example, they say, we say, uh, there are more pilots in, in the heaven than the pastors because pastors make people sleep, but pilots make people pray. <laughs> pray multiple times, right? <clears throat> There's another funny story that, you know, while Jesus was uh, keeping the door in the, in the entrance of the, of the heaven called the pearly gate, and there was an old man coming in, and Jesus let him stand in the judgment, judgment you know, table and ask him a question. What did you do for a living on earth? And the old man said, I was a carpenter. And Jesus asked him back, thinking about his own earthly life. Did you have a family? And the old man said, I had a son, but I lost him. And Jesus leaned forward a little bit and asked him again, can you tell me about your son? And the old man said, he had holes in hands and in his feet. And Jesus leaned even more, more forward to him and asked him, Father? And the, the old man replied, Pinocchio? <laughs> so that's the kind of joke the pastors say. There are a lot of funny stories about heaven, but we also hear serious, serious questions about resurrection. Can I see my dead dog in the heaven? If somebody lost his limbs in an accident, can he have his limbs back? 
in the heaven? Will I see the one who abused me in the heaven? There are a lot of questions we raise about heaven. Before we see how Jesus responded to the question of the Sadducees, it is important to know that who the Sadducees were because this, their positions on faith and the world still resonate with a lot of Christians. They were wealthy. They held power, powerful positions, including the chief priest and high priest. They held the majority of the 70 seats of the ruling council called the Sanhedrin in the Jerusalem temple, which was the final authority on making decisions in the life of the Jews in the time of Jesus, like the Supreme Court in the United States. The Sanhedrin later arrested Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and they brought him into the temple court. Religiously, as described in the today's passage, the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. They regarded the only, only the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament, are the word of God. Rejecting other books in the Old Testament, like the historic books, the poetic books, and the prophetic books. It is very significant because the prophetic books describe God's judgment and final redemption of God's people. And they reject that idea. So what does it mean that they acknowledge the Moses law only while rejecting the idea of God's final judgment? What does it mean that they did not believe in resurrection of the dead? It means that they focus solely on how to live on earth. It means they understood the Mosaic law as the end of the faith, not as the tool to be intimate with God. What is the result of such faith, believing in the law of God without believing in the resurrection. They took the, powerful, they took the powerful positions. They established the rules and regulations of the Jewish society in ways in which their power structure is justified and reinforced. It is not surprising to know that they supported and cooperated with the Roman Empire the greatest power of the world in his time, playing the representative role of the Roman Empire like a puppet. Let's go back to the passage. To the questions of the Sadducees, if all of seven brothers died and the wife also died, whose wife she would be in the time of resurrection? Jesus responded in verse 34 that the resurrected people neither marry nor are given in marriage. They can no longer die, for they are like the angels. They are God's children, since, this is, since they are children of the resurrection. The only matter for them is they are God's children. No other names are necessary for them. However, even though this is a good answer, and we understand what he is talking about, but Jesus did not stop there and presented a very important idea about resurrection to them. In verse 37, he continues, Moses showed that the dead was raised as he spoke of God as the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, Isaac, and God of Jacob. If you read this verse more carefully, you may raise two questions here. First, 
It is not Moses to say, to express the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob. In Exodus 3, when Moses met God for the first time in the burning bush, it was God who introduced himself as the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of, the, God of Jacob. So we can say this is an inaccurate uh, citation of the Exodus by the author of the Gospel of Luke. Second, it does not seem to be appropriate to mention the names like Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob to conclude that God is the God of God is not the God of the dead, God is the God of the living, because they were all dead. I struggle to connect this discrepancy and to understand what the Gospel of Luke really means by this. Jesus mentioned the names of founding fathers who were already dead to claim that God is the God of the living, not God of not of the dead. Maybe this is the key to understanding of the resurrection. Maybe this is the key to making sense of the connection between our life on earth and the everlasting life in heaven. If we look at the passage more, more closely, Jesus even goes further. In verse 38, he says, all of them are alive for him. All of them are alive for him. I have to tell you that this translation is a little bit paraphrased because the original meaning of the, uh, the Greek Bible text is a little ambiguous. The original Greek words are, all live unto him, instead of all of them are alive for him. All live unto him. According to the Greek words, it means that all lives depend on our relation to God. It means that if our, our lives depend on our relation with God, our lives may cease to exist on earth but never be extinguished. Throughout the whole New Testament, this idea comes, comes back over and over. In John 17.3, in his last prayer to God, Jesus said, Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. He understands the eternal life is the relationship with God, not whether we take our breath or not. Eternal life is to know God and Jesus Christ. Likewise, in John chapter eleven twenty-five, Jesus says to Martha, the sister of Lazarus, that I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Maybe Jesus asked you the same question. Do you believe this? If we are connected to God, it's not the death who can seize that relationship with God. We are, we are living eternal life on earth, which will continue to be lived in the everlasting life in the heaven. For many Christians, the resurrection of the dead does not mean much in their lives, just like the Sadducees. Maybe they're like Sadducees, they only focus on urgent issues of their lives without knowing where their lives are going. Maybe they lost their centeredness in life. Maybe they lost their passion and diligence 
to make the glory of God manifested in their lives, in the church, and in the world. What is the result? Just like the Sadducees, they may gain more powerful, more power, more wealth, and more popularity, but they lost their ultimate goal of life, which is the relationship with God. Just like the Sadducees, they may let our reality, their reality define their future. Like Sadducees, we may let our pride define our relationship with others. We may let our privileges define the values of other people. We may let our struggles define who God is. Brothers and sisters, God wants the opposite. God wants us to understand the resurrection defines our lives. The kingdom of God defines our current relationship with others. The glory of God defines our decisions in life. The hopes of final redemption defines our struggles. N.T. Wright describes in his book, Surprised by Hope, this is my favorite book, the resurrection of Jesus is the beginning of the resurrection of Jesus is the beginning of God's new project, not to snatch people away from earth to heaven, but to colonize earth with the life of heaven. Our second reading, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 13 through 17, summarized the attitude to our life more clearly. It says, God chose you as the first fruits for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and through belief in the truth. For this purpose, he called you through our proclam proclamation of the good news so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters in Christ, God hopes us to be the fruits for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and through the belief in the truth. In our faith journey, we have to bear more fruits of salvation every day until we see the resurrection of our body. Our daily life is only defined and assessed by the time of resurrection. In the discussion of, of the resurrection, I cannot say nothing about the election in two days. I can make a decision for you, but keep in mind that the resurrection and the kingdom of God is the most important factor to make your decision. This is the touchstone of Christians in whatever we do and whoever we have relationship with on earth. I still listen to the song that I learned from the Mandan Church choir in the service three weeks ago. He made a change. I listened to the song more than 10 times. He made a change in the way that I'm walking. He made a change in the way that I'm talking. All things pass away. Behold, everything's new. If he can make a change in me, he can make a change in you. May God help all of us to live our hope for resurrection in our daily life. Amen.